This video is sponsored by Squarespace. More about them later. Ice types. Nobody's favorite type of Pokemon. Actually, it's my favorite type of Pokemon. Okay, nobody important's favorite type of Pokemon. They have a ton of weaknesses, only one single resistance, and they aren't exactly the most ubiquitous of the 16 types. But I decided to do a hardcore Nuzlocke of Pokemon Sword using only Ice types anyways. If a Pokemon faints in battle, it's dead forever. And since I can only catch the first Ice type I find per route, every encounter matters. I can't actually catch an Ice type Pokemon until my rival Hop and I get to the Wild Area. Wild Area encounters are very weathered Dependent, so on my first outing, without any snow, the only Pokemon I can catch is a Shelter. Good thing One Ball HG never fails. Little Cube is no Ice type, but by carefully making my way deeper into the wild area, I can pick up a Water Stone and immediately evolve him into a Cloister, a frankly ridiculously powerful Pokemon for this early in the game. And since he's a Stone Evolution, I can even go to the Pokemon Center and immediately teach him some extremely powerful moves from his level up moveset, including Shell Smash, but don't worry, I won't be using setup moves. Shell Smash on Cloyster in particular makes things way too easy. Oh, fun fact, the entire wild area has snowy weather on December 25th, so I can very quickly catch Cap the Snover, Box the Delibird, Cream the Vanillish, and Age the Swinub, who might be the cutest little fella I've ever seen. We as a society don't talk enough about how adorable Swinub is, and heading into 2024, I'd like to change that, which is why I'm proud to announce that from from now on, February 20th will be officially known as National Swine Up Day. Yes, I have the authority to do that. To find out about National Swine Up Day events in your neighborhood, call 1-800-SWINE-NUBS and be sure to use the hashtag hashtag swine up day on Twitter to share how you'll be celebrating. Anyways, I also caught Ickle the Snow Run, meaning that as we head into the opening ceremony of the Galar Gym Challenge, I've got a full team of six ice types. Although my boy Cube is kind of the main star of the show right now. For example, he easily coals through Hop's team of weaklings. Because I chose Sobble, Hop chose Score Bunny, who's no problem now, but will definitely be an issue once he evolves, especially if anything were to happen to Bestie Cube. But I'd have to be a total idiot to ever risk my best Pokemon, so that's never gonna happen. On our way to Turf Field, I catch a sweet little Eevee named Spice, and by visiting the Digging Duo back in the wild area, I snag an Ice Stone that evolves him into a Glacier. On. And while I'm here, I hunt down the Dawnstone in Giant's Cap to evolve Ickle into Frostlass. So we've got a pretty stacked squad as we enter the Turf Field Stadium to take on the first gym leader, Milo. This poor bastard uses Grass types, one of the few types that has a negative matchup into Ice types. An icy wind from Spice sends Gossiflor to the cooler, quickly bringing in Milo's Ace Puff, who immediately Dynamaxes into Big Puff. Dynamax is banned in this playthrough, so figuring out how to stall the three turns of our enemy's Galarian gimmick will be imperative going forward. Against Big Puff, Ickle can come in on a normal type max strike, so that's turn one. Using Protect, quarters the damage of any max move, letting Ickle easily shrug off a max overgrowth. And then I can bring in Cap, who resists Big Puff's final max overgrowth before he returns to his smaller, huggable form. So just a few turns later, Ickle ices Milo's ace, and the first gym badge is ours which means it's time to wipe the floor with Hop's team once again. Man, I hope repeatedly getting crushed like an empty beer can on a frat bro's forehead doesn't send Hop down a dark and depressive existential crisis the likes of which he may never fully recover from. In the beautiful town of Holberry, which has a bizarrely honky-tonk musical theme for seemingly no reason, like, listen to this, what is this? Are we at the rodeo or something? Anyways, in Holberry, we face off against Nessa for badge number two. Ickle quickly dispatches her Golding with a few hexes, and Cube takes out her Aracuda with Pin Missile. But her devastating Dynamax Dreadnought threatens massive one-hit KOs on my Ice types with powerful, super-effective Rock-type Max moves. Is what I would say if he actually knew any Rock-type Max moves, but since he doesn't, Cube stalls out his Dynamax, and then Cap gets to KO with a quad-effective Magical Leaf. Ness has been defeated, and after an exceptionally long handshake, we're on our way to Motostoke for the first major challenge of the playthrough. 
Well, first, there's a fight against Marnie, which isn't that big of a deal, but Box does come through and get the KO on her lead, Krogunk, with a hustle-boosted drill pack. I just want to show her some love here, since this is really all Box is going to get to do. The rest of Marnie's team is quick and speedy work for my remaining teammates. But you know who knows a thing or two about quick and speedy work? That's right, six-time Piston Cup winner Lightning McQueen, but also Squarespace, the sponsor of this video. Squarespace is an online platform that helps you easily and efficiently build and manage your own website, whether that's an online store for your business or a personal blog for your thoughts. With their all-in-one platform and customizable templates, it's remarkably simple for for anyone to create professional and polished websites. Plus, using Squarespace's Fluid Engine design system featuring drag and drop technology, you can quickly fine tune every single detail of your website. For example, I use Squarespace to create poppyhg.com, the only destination to find curated pictures of my corgi puppy, Poppy. Manifest some snow in Boston, folks, because Poppy loves playing in the snow. But she also knows when to stop fooling around and focus on her online business endeavors, which is why it's great that Squarespace has a ton of other really useful features to get the most out of your website. Website, like analytic information about the traffic of your website and Squarespace member areas, which can be used to connect with audiences and create exclusive members-only content. So if you're looking to start a website for your business or hobby or corgi, then you should check out squarespace.com for a free trial. And when you're ready to launch your website, you can use our custom link to save 10% off your first purchase of a website or domain. Thanks so much to Squarespace for sponsoring this video. Now, let's get back to the challenge. Against the Motostoke Gym Leader, we've got a pretty big problem. Kabu specializes in fire types, which are very dangerous for six out of my seven ice types, since ice types don't like being burned alive. Pathetic. To make things worse, all three of his Pokemon are fully evolved, and the first two like to spam speedy Will-O-Wisps that will have the damage of physical attacks like Cube's otherwise powerful Razor Shell. Oh, and his Arthropodic Radiator likes to use G-Max Scentiferno, which traps you in via Fire Spin Residual, making it much harder to safely stall out Dynamax turns. So this Silver Fox is pretty damn scary. He leads with his Nene Tails, and I lead with Cap to get the weather advantage, though it becomes immediately evident that his Vixen has Flash Fire instead of drought, meaning that this was largely unnecessary. I guess I should have looked at the Bulbapedia graphic a little closer, huh? Still, using Protect means that I can get some chip from Hail, I guess. I bring in Spice, who has Snow Cloak to up his evasion, though it doesn't stop Kabu from nailing us with an Ember that at the very least is halved by our held Akaberry. But then Nene Tails goes for a few Will-O-Wisps, which miss, and let Spice nail her first with Icy Wind, and then with Swift. We do get Burn before ultimately getting the KO, but Spice remains at well over 50% as Arcanine comes in next. Baiting Flame Wheel, I bring in Cube, who shrugs it off thanks to his monstrous physical defense and held leftovers. Protecting grants me even more leftovers recovery and shows that Kabu is prioritizing Will-O-Wisp over additional damage. So, not wanting to get burned, I switch to Cap, which is pretty risky, but pays off as we get the Hail set up once again. Another switch to Cube and some Protects lets the Hail Chip rack up for a few turns and keeps Cube relatively healthy. So then it's a switch to Age, hashtag swine up day, make it happen folks, who unfortunately comes in on a flame wheel instead of the predicted Will-O-Wisp. Her Akaberry ensures that she graciously survives the hit, but she obviously can't take another. The goal here was to hit Arcanine with a bulldoze to give Cube the speed advantage so that he could take the kill with a razor shell before getting burned, but now I need another plan. I don't want Age going down, but somebody has to take a flame wheel here. So, with a heavy heart, I bring in Box, who gets hit by a Will-O-Wisp for some reason, which means that I could have stayed in with Age, but obviously I had no idea that Kabu just wouldn't go for the kill. Ultimately, Box still has to fall to a Flame Wheel on the following turn, which marks the first death of the run. But her death won't be in vain, because this lets me bring in Spice, who with a commendable physical defense stat is able to eat a Flame Wheel and retaliate with an Icy Wind to finally lower Arcanine's speed. With that, I bring in Cube on another soft Flame Wheel, and then, just to be safe, I go for Protect to get some HP back with Leftovers. But Arcanine uses agility. 
With that, he gets the speed advantage yet again, and before I can fire off a razor shell, the thing that I tried so hard to avoid comes to pass. Box is burned, and I have thrown this match. We can still get the KO against Arcanine on the following turn, but Cube has now taken way too much damage to deal with Kabu's Scentiscorch. I completely forgot that Arcanine had agility, and that mistake is going to cost me a whole lot of deaths. As the mighty Gigantamaxing insect roars to life, Cube can eat a max flutterby by going for protect. On his second turn, Kabu opts for another max flutterby, which brings Cube down to 11 HP before he fires off a soft razor shell for some damage. With another protect, Cube should actually be able to survive one more max flutterby, but Kabu fires off a G Max Centiferno instead. And even though Cube lives with 4 HP, the fire spin residual is enough to permanently fridge my starter. I bring in Ickle, but even though Kabu's Dynamax is over, we've got a long uphill battle if we want to win this thing. Our Hex does very little damage as Scentiscorch goes for Coil. Another Hex brings him below 50%, but then Scentiscorch goes for Flame Wheel, which Ickle survives thanks to our third and final held Akaberry. Looking at the state of my team, I only see one way to get out of this, and it's gonna be ugly. I start with a switch to cap to set up the hail, and as my mighty evergreen falls to another flame wheel, I thank him for his sacrifice, because with the hail chip, we can now win this battle. But, and this breaks my heart, it still requires one last sacrifice. Age storms the field, eyes wide with youthful exuberance as mine water from uncontrollable tears. With a protect, she makes Scentiscorch take another turn of Hail Chip, and then she fires off a priority ice shard before meeting her three friends in the great beyond. Rest well, my piggy compatriot. Every February 20th, your legacy will live on and inspire countless others to be bold, live strong, and love hard. Age's death means that Ikko can come back out. One last protect brings Scentiscorch even lower, and then with a final hex, she takes the kill to avenge her fallen teammates, narrowly winning us the third gym badge against Kabu. But this victory came with a brutal cost. Four Pokemon dead. Over half of my friends gone in a flash, never to be seen again. Although Box, Cube, Cap, and age will never be forgotten, we need to rebuild if we want to win this challenge. After all, that's the only way to right my wrongs and honor their deaths. This challenge just became personal. The good news is that with the new level cap, the rest of the wild area is mine to explore, so it's time for a recruitment montage. Skates the Sneasel and Hockey the Cub Chew join up first. A speed demon and a future brute, these two are a welcome addition to our frozen squad. Then there's Ocelis the Mr. Mime, found deep within a raid den in the stony wilderness. A performer with a flair for the dramatics, he's ready to tap dance his way to the Hall of Fame. And last for the wild area encounters is Otol, the Galarian Darumaka, an Irish maiden with a fiery soul and a hearty liver. But we're not done there because it's off to the Isle of Armor next. And after painstakingly finding 20 Alolan Diglets, this nameless man introduces me to Luge the Alolan Vulpix. I really hope she was worth that 30 minute detour, but with her hidden ability to start a snowstorm, she's the perfect spiritual successor to Deer Cap. Which means that last, but certainly not least, is Dati the Arctivish, a bloodthirsty predator brought back from ancient times to strike fear into the hearts of, uh... You okay there, buddy? Y you, uh... Don't, don't look great. It hurts to breathe. Um... Well, anyways, after all that, our team is looking pretty stacked once again, so I'm feeling confident heading into the fight against the fourth gym leader, B, despite another poor type matchup. She leads with Hitmontop, and I lead with Luge. Our Wintry Fox is not quite strong enough to one-shot Hitmontop with our super effective fairy type attacks, so I start first with a Protect as Hitmontop goes for Revenge. Then I disable his move on the following turn and proceed to Protect for a second time to get three full turns of Hail Chip, putting our foe into range to a single Dazzling Gleam. That's what you get for standing on your feet like a real boy, Hitmontop. You had one job and it was to gleefully spin like a dreidel on the eighth night of Hanukkah. 
Our cheeky little strategy to one-shot Hitmon Flop means that Luge remains at full HP as Pangoro comes in second, which is important because this guy has access to the quad effective priority steel type move, Bullet Punch. But at full HP and without Pangoro having Iron Fist, Luge is barely safe to even a critical hit, letting her counter with another dazzling gleam. Against Surfetched, I bring in Ocelis to get the kill with an expert belt boosted Psychic, which means that last is B's Gigantamax Machamp. But he's fairly easy to stall out with my current team. Spice eats a max darkness, Frostlass is immune to a max strike, and then Luge resists another max darkness, though admittedly a crit there would have killed her. But since it didn't, we can now pivot back to Ickle. The only move that Machamp knows that can hit our ghostly gal is Knock Off, but by not giving her an item, it seems that the AI gets confused and simply spams Scary Face. But by the time I figure that out, it becomes easier to just pivot to Otope, the fully evolved Darmanitan, who with a Choppleberry is is safe to get the KO on Machamp with an Ice Punch and win us the fourth Gym Badge. Since Galarian Darmanitan is a fairly uncommon Pokemon, something you should know about Otope here is that she has the ability Gorilla Tactics, which gives her a 50% boost to her attack stat at the expense of getting locked into a single move. It's basically a built-in choice band, which off of an attack stat of 140 is objectively ridiculous. Our little Irish lady is free to handily smack the shit out of Bead's Pokemon with just a few ice punches. Gorilla Tactics also pairs really well with the choice scarf I pick up in Balonlia, so that'll be Otope's item of choice from here on out. But side note, this fetch quest here is extremely weird. There's a little girl named Paula in Hammerlock that asks you to deliver a letter to her friend Frank, and it turns out that Frank is an old man, but when you talk to Frank, he reveals that Paula was his childhood friend that got sick, which brings up a lot of questions. What's going on here? Is Paula a time traveler? Does Frank just have dementia? Is Paula a clone? Is this all a vague reference to something profoundly British that I've never heard of? Regardless, we've got a short stay in Belonglia because the fifth gym leader Opal is pretty straightforward thanks to the stat boosts you get in the battle by answering her questions correctly, or rather by answering her questions in the way she wants. Age is not a disease, Opal. Embrace the rapidly approaching end to the painful existence that is living the human condition. Oh right, the battle. Ocelis kills the Weezing with Psychic, Luge two-shots Mawile, who doesn't know a Steel-type move, with Blizzards, and then runs it back against Togekiss, before stalling out all Creamy's Gigantamax, and then swapping to Otope, who gets the final KO with Ice Punch once again. Vague references to my questionable mental health aside, that was a pretty easy fifth gym badge. So right on cue, it's time for another battle against the rival that just won't quit. This is the first fight where Hop has his fully evolved starter, and to make things worse, he has a Snorlax that can set up with Stockpile, and a second fire type in the form of Heatmore. But he does lead first with a Trevenant, which means that I can lead with Spice and set up a Rain Dance. The Undead Tree hits us with a Confuse Ray, but since Spice is holding a Person Berry, we can just follow up with a clean kill via Ice Beam on the following turn. That then immediately brings in Cinderachi. It's Italian, like Liberace, trust me. Even in the rain, a neutral Pyro Ball does a solid chunk of damage to poor DT who comes in. Can't say I love their minus defense nature, but at the very least, Hop just goes for an agility on the next turn, meaning that we can freely retaliate with a rain boosted Surf for another one hit kill. That brings in Boltund with super effective Spark, so I switch to Otope, only to be immediately roared away. I try bringing her in several more times, but Hop just continues to spam Roar. Like, without fail, every time I bring in Otope, Otope, he roars me out. This is incredibly annoying because Otope has Choice Scarf Earthquake, which can easily one-shot not only Boltund, but the Heat more that will be baited out next. Eventually, I start protecting with random Pokemon, hoping that by chance Otope will be able to come in for free since Roar actually goes through Protect. But after a few turns, it seems like Boltund is done roaring, so I just hard switch to my Hulking Ape, and Hop finally goes for Spark, which paralyzes ensuring that Otope no longer outspeeds. So, that means I need to switch to Spice in order to set up another Rain Dance before Heatmore tears through my team with Fire Lash, but we of course immediately get roared out again, this time bringing in T. Desperate to get rid of the most annoying Greyhound in Galar, I stay in and get hit by a Spark, which paralyzes again, and then immediately causes a full paralysis. 
The good news is that I stay in and Bolt Hunt appears to go for a roar, meaning that we move first and finally get the KO. But frustratingly, this now baits in Snorlax next, since the T is not weak to Heatmore's Fire Lash. So I bring in Hockey as Snorlax goes for Body Slam, and you already know what happens. Snorlax now outspeeds and goes for a second Body Slam before we get fully paralyzed. Then our enemy sets up a stockpile to boost his defenses, meaning that now our superpower no longer longer gets the KO. So, I switch to DT on yet another body slam. We then get fully paralyzed again, letting Snorlax set up a second stockpile. If I nudge this asshole into healing range, this is basically all over. So instead, I decide to go to Otope on a third stockpile. But even at plus three defense, a superpower is enough to get the KO as we somehow manage to avoid full paralysis. Of course, now we have to deal with the Heatmore, which is normally not a particularly difficult or good Pokemon, but is signature move Fire Lash is an 80 base power fire type attack that's guaranteed to lower our defense, which makes switching between Pokemon much riskier. But I can get around it by first switching to Luge and graciously dodging the critical hit. Then I click Disable, which grants me a moderately safe switch into Spice, who can nail Heatmore with an Ice Beam, and then set up a Rain Dance as Heatmore's Disable wears off. And finally, I can bring in Ocelis to get the kill with Psychic, at long last winning us one of the most painfully annoying fights I've ever experienced. But the greater the challenge, the sweeter the reward, and on the other side of Hop is Route 8, where I catch Ice Baby the Snom. May he bring peace and prosperity for years to come. Unfortunately, the fight against the 6th gym leader is no place for Ice Baby. Gordy specializes in rock types, which are super effective into literally every single one of my Pokemon, but thankfully rock types kinda suck. Barbarical is one shot by a Grass Knot from Ocelis, who has fully evolved into a Mr. Rhyme. Shuckle and Stonejourner are killed by Surfs from DT, and then with Rain set up, Gordy's Gigantamax Colossal also goes down to a single Surf, swiftly winning us another gym badge. But with that, it's been almost 10 full minutes of gameplay since we've had to fight Hop, which simply won't do. Without Hop's rich and worthwhile character arc, we've got nothing. NOTHING! Fortunately, his new team is much easier since he no longer has Heatmore, Snorlax no longer knows Stockpile, and his Corviknight doesn't even know a Steel-type move. So a few turns later, and we're off to Surchester Bay, where I catch a Bergmite named Berg. Really had to stretch the old noggin coming up with that nickname. That's the PhD at work, baby. On the other side of the bay is Spike Muth, where a rematch against Marnie awaits. But unfortunately for her, every single one of her Pokémon gets one shot by Luge. So, moving on. Prior to taking on Marnie's big brother, Ice Baby, Skates, and Berg all evolve, and coincidentally, all of them are coming along for the fight against Pierce. You ever notice how when he stands still, he looks like SpongeBob hanging from the ceiling? Pierce's lead Scrafty is eviscerated by a dazzling gleam from Luge. Malamar lands a nasty critical hit Psycho Cut into Ice Baby on the Switch, but then gets one shot by a quad effective Bug Buzz. Obstagoon comes in third, so it's back to Luge, who gets a two shot with Dazzling Gleam and only has to tank a fairly soft Shadow Claw in return, meaning that rather quickly, last is Skun Tank. And Pierce reveals that he knows Sucker Punch and Toxic. So, thanks for the heads up, I guess. Doesn't really matter because neither of those things threaten Luge for much damage, especially when she connects with two blizzards in a row, winning us an incredibly easy 7th gym badge. And then, it's a shockingly short trip to Hammerlock for the showdown against the final gym leader, Raihan. But despite being kind of a Dragon-type trainer, his fight is a tough nut to crack. It's a double battle for starters, and with his Gigantamax Duraludon having access to Steel, Rock, and Fighting-type moves, he's got a way to hit every single one of my Pokemon for super effective damage with at least two moves. But after a lot of brainstorming, I came up with a pretty solid game plan. Against his Gigalith and Flygon, I lead with Skates and Spice. Gigalith's Sandstream activates, but I immediately switch Skates out for Luge to set up the Hail. This then allows Spice with a Choice Scarf to nail Flygon and Gigalith with perfectly accurate Blizzards, one-shotting the former and heavily damaging the latter. Skates baited Gigalith into going for Body Press, which is only neutral against 
luge thanks to her fairy typing. So things are looking perfect as Sandaconda replaces Flygon on Raihan's side of the field. On the following turn, Spice once again fires off a Choice Scarf Blizzard, instantly killing both of Raihan's Pokemon, though hitting Sandaconda does activate his Sand Spit ability. But I came prepared for that because I have Luge Reset Hail manually, which means that as Duraludon comes out completely alone, all we have to do is sit through an exceptionally long Dynamax animation before outspeeding and nailing him with double single target blizzards. The ferocious Duraludon explodes in defeat, and just like that, we've won the eighth and final gym badge. So now it's off to the bustling city of Winden for the prolonged endgame that is the Championship Cup. We start with the prelims, which consist of fights against Marnie and Hop. The former is extremely straightforward. Luge one-shots her first four Pokemon with a combination of Dazzling Gleam and Psy Shock. Since her Grimmsnarl Dynamaxes, we gotta stall him out with Protect and switches to Berg, the unstoppably bulky Avalug. But after that, it's back to Luge who gets the kill with one final Dazzling Gleam. Easy stuff. But Hop ain't so simple. His Cinderachi will Dynamax, and that big bunny is a massive issue, especially since he also has access to Max Knuckle. Before that, though, my rival's lead Dubwool is easy to pick off with a few blizzards from what is starting to be a very clear frontrunner for MVP of the challenge. Corviknight comes in second, and this time has Steel Wings, so I switch to DT. A few surfs, and he goes down without DT taking too much damage in return. That then brings in Hop Snorlax with Hammer Arm, so I go to Berg for a face-off of the tanks. Even with super effective damage, Berg shrugs off the hits without any problem. And she has access to Recover, so she can retaliate with a few Earthquakes to eventually get the KO. But I do make sure to set up Rain Dance before taking the kill, because Hop's final Pokemon before bringing in his big gun is Pin Kirchin, who just falls to a single earthquake. So, as Cinderachi comes in last and Hop goes for possibly one of the scariest Dynamaxes in the playthrough, we've got Rain up to have the damage of Max Flare. But even in the rain, Max Flare should still do the most damage of all of his moves, so the plan is to comfortably eat Max Flares and set up Rain Dances after each one to reverse the sun that gets set up. Unfortunately, Hop, whether by accident or via some sort of mastermind plan, goes for Max Knuckle instead of Max Flare, which not only gives him an attack boost, but also renders my follow-up Rain Dance completely moot. And what's worse is that that was the last turn of my previous Rain Dance, so Berg has to brace for a plus one, full-powered Max Flare that engulfs her in a burning bright white light. But as the battlefield clears, Berg is still standing with just 6 HP, letting her set up a Rain Dance. Unfortunately, we gotta switch out here, and since Berg is so low, it's likely going to be a random move. DT comes in and eats another Max Knuckle, which they do handily survive, but now we're staring down a plus two attack Cinderachi. A Protect reveals that Hop's going for Gunk Shot, but nobody is surviving that hit at least with Berg and DT having already taken so much damage. At this point, my only hope is for this wannabe Digimon to miss his 80% accurate move. But he doesn't, and DT goes down, perhaps mercifully ending what was surely a painful existence. But DT's sacrifice does ensure that Otope can come in for free, and with a choice scarf she outspeeds Hop's evil rabbit and secures the one shot with Earthquake, marking us the victors of the preliminary rounds of the Championship Cup. Rest well, DT, you'll be missed. The silver lining on the sad cloud of yet another death is that with the new level cap of 55, the T's legacy can live on with the final encounter of the run, an overworld Lepra that resides in the lake on Route 2. Somewhere. Allegedly. It takes a while, but eventually I do find her, and welcome to coffee onto the team with open arms. Better late than never, I suppose. After the quick Macrocosmos detour, it's time for the finals of the Championship Cup, which act as an Elite Four stand-in of sorts. You are able to change your team between rounds, but for the sake of, I don't know, posterity, I guess, I'll be using the same team of six for all four fights. So here they are, all leveled up to match the level of Raihan's ace. With a few imposing Dynamax threats still to come, let's see if these six have what it takes. First up is Bede, who has fully committed to being a Fairy-type trainer. His lead Ma Wile is killed by an Earthquake from Otope, even after Intimidate. Against Gardevoir, I bring in Ocelise, who locks her into Calm Mind via Encore and grants me a free switch back to Otope. 
She's then able to snag one shots with Iron Head against Gardevoir, as well as Rapidash. Dynamax Hatterene is just ever so slightly too bulky, so I stall her out by switching to Dekafi on a Max Flare, and then using our Natural Bulk to safely set up a Rain Dance and tank a G-Max Smite. Then a final switch to Ocelise on Max Mindstorm ends her Dynamax, and grants me a safe switch back to Otope, who goes 4 for 4 KOs with one last Iron Head. So long, Bead. Better luck next time. In the second round, we have to face off against Nessa, but Ickle proves to be the perfect counter to her water types. Against her lead Galissapod, Ickle goes for Thunderbolt, which isn't enough for a one-shot, but it does do enough to trigger Emergency Exit before he can get off an attack. With Barrascuta coming in, our held Choice Scarf ensures we can outspeed and nail the Frail Fish with a Thunderbolt for the one-shot. That brings Galissapod back in, who now goes down to a second Thunderbolt. Sea King is somehow bulky enough to tank a Thunderbolt, but ends up getting fully paralyzed. Then I switch to Dekafi as she sets up Aqua Ring. So with that, we stay at full HP as the self-proclaimed King of the Sea falls to another Thunderbolt, which means that last for Nessa before her Dynamax is Pelipper. I don't want to get the KO quite yet, so I start with an Ice Beam just for a good chunk of damage. Nessa sets up Tailwind, which means I need to be a bit strategic about how I time things, because I don't want Dreadnought coming in with a speed boost. This is a little annoying because Pelipper also has Roost to recover, but eventually I can get Ocelies in at a point where Tailwind has expired, and Pelipper is at low enough HP to be knocked out by a Choice Specs boosted Energy Ball, which means that even though Nessa Gigantamaxes her uncircumcised turtle, a single quad effective Energy Ball is enough to immediately blow her to pieces and win us the battle. Two down, two to go. But the third round is against B, and she's a piece of cake. Luge one-shots her Halucha, Phalanx, and Surfetch. Grapplelocked has no way to damage ghost types, ensuring a safe switch into Ickle, who gets the kill with Choice Spec Psychic. B's Gigantamax Machamp has Max Flare off of Fire Punch, but Dekafi can comfortably switch in and tank the hit. Then, since she now baits G-Max Chi-Strike, it's a free switch back to Ickle, before immediately going back out into DT to eat the final Max Flare. With Machamp's pants back off, like Arceus intended, Berg can comfortably eat a few hits and set up Rain Dance, especially thanks to her held Choppleberry. Then, with Rain Support, Ickle is completely safe to come back in and KO Machamp with two Psychics, leaving just one more round of the Championship Cup to go. And it's against Raihan, who's now back with a single battle, which in some ways should be much easier than our previous double battle, but it certainly makes his Duraludon a bit trickier. For starters, though, his two Fire-type Turtles are one-shot by Earthquakes from Oto. Against Gudra, I switch to Ocelise, who locks her into Rain Dance with Encore, ensuring a free two-hit kill with Ice Beam. Then it's my boy Flygon, who is unfortunately just walled by Berg. Raihan is also obsessed with weather, so with a bit of patience and stalling via Recover, I can bait Flygon into setting up Sandstorm on the turn I take the KO with Ice Fang, ensuring that we're at full HP as Raihan's Duraludon comes in last. Thankfully, this guy is a physical attacker, so even though super effective max steel spikes hit pretty hard, Bird can just click recover to get back to full HP every time, successfully stalling out all three of our enemies' Dynamax turns. Now, he did get three defense boosts, which is a tad scary since Duraludon also has body press, but it still doesn't do that much to Berg, who is free to retaliate with her own body presses for solid damage. After two turns, I switch to Dekafi as Raihan heals. Since Dekafi has shell armor, she can save safely tank one body press and counter with an ice beam. Then a free switch to Ickle on another body press means that she can finally knock out Duraludon with a shadow ball, winning us the battle and earning me the right to challenge Leon for the title of Galar Champion. But before the fight can get underway, we're interrupted by Chairman Rose's ambiguous plan to save the distant future from running out of energy or whatever. So time for another Macrocosmos detour. Rose's steel types all get one shot by fire punches to the face from Otope. The only potentially scary threat is Rose's Gigantamax Caparaggio, which is so damn stupid looking. Have you ever actually seen Gigantamax Caparaggio from the side? Where did the back half of that Pokemon go? Why does it look like a Goomba? Anyways, Dekafi can eat the first two G-Max Steel Surges, and then I can carelessly risk Pocky against the third. His held Babiri Berry means he would barely survive a non-crit, but Rose just goes for Max Quake instead, so Hockey is free to get the KO on the now properly four-legged Caparaja with a superpower. Aw, oh, look! I reminded the unhinged sociopath that pitting Pokemon against each other to the death can be fun! 
Yay! Now it's up to the roof of the energy plant to stop Eternatus, but Shell Armor Dukafi can pretty easily sponge hits with the help of Zamazenta's light screen. So all we gotta do is sit back, let the two doggies do 95% of the work, and then snipe the KO in the last minute to get all the credit and eternal glory. I am the sole hero of Galar. Show me praise, for I promise that you'll never find another like me. As the doggies fly off into the sky, yeah, I, I guess they can fly, it's time to turn my attention to the final fight of the run. One last battle against Leon, who for too long has sat upon his throne uncontested. He's grown cocky. I mean, listen to this dude. Crushing you into the dirt will show everyone just how strong their champion truly is? Jesus, dude, I'm 10 years old. It sounds like you need to chill. Leon throws off his cape to show he means business and sends out Aegislash. I bring in Luge, who goes for a protect to get Aegislash to switch into his blade form, and then on the following turn, an expert belt boosted Dark Pulse gets a clean KO. But what happens next is pretty brutal. For Leon, Haxorus gets outsped and one shot by Blizzard. Rhyperior gets outsped and one shot by Blizzard. Dragapult does not get outsped, but merely fires off a modest flamethrower. And then Leon has the gall to tell me that aiming for super effective hits is a surefire way to claim victory. Yeah, dude, I just did that three times in a row. Bye, Dragapult. All of a sudden, Leon is down to just two Pokemon, the first being Rillaboom. I switch to Berg, who as usual eats Rillaboom's physical hits like the champ she is. The reason for this is so that we can set up Rain Dance before taking the kill with two Ice Fangs, which she does indeed do. So, as Leon's mighty ace Charizard Gigantamaxes, rain pours across the battlefield, which lets the coffee tank a massive G-Max wildfire. Unfortunately, that wildfire chip is a big issue and ensures that Dukafi cannot survive a max overgrowth without going for protect. That's two turns of Charizard's Dynamax done, but there's still one more. One last powerful hit. I bring in Ickle, who's sporting an assault vest to ensure that she can survive the massive max rockfall that comes out to change the weather. When all the residual damage plays out and Charizard shrinks down to regular size, Ickle is sitting at 28 HP. She survived, yes, but sadly her job's not done. We need a safe switch here, so Ickle has to go down. She can outspeed to hit Charizard with Thunderbolt for a good chunk of damage. But then... Charizard misses Fire Blast! Ickle lives! She's done it! She's won! So much death. Six friends lost to the hands of fate, but no more. It's time to end this. Otope takes to the field with vengeance fueling her fiery soul. Fist clenched, she hurls towards Ickle's murderer, and with one last ice punch, she fells the mighty dragon. Charizard has been defeated, and with that, we've won not just the champion fight against Leon, but the entire run. And so ends the final video of 2023. This was a very fun challenge, and I love how playing around Dynamax forces you to come up with really interesting strategies. I definitely want to keep doing Sword and Shield playthroughs, but let me know what challenges you want to see in the new year by commenting down below. Also, in case you're curious, I'm recovering from COVID while recording this, so if my voice sounds a little weird, that's why. Regardless, thank you all so much for all the support this past year, and if you enjoyed watching this video, it'd be great if you could like the video and subscribe to the channel. Or don't, I don't know, but I do know that you should consider joining my Patreon or becoming a channel member on YouTube because I'm about to kick off a massive snap lock in Renegade Platinum, and that's how you'll be able to get additional votes to ban the most powerful Pokemon. Be sure to check out the community tab for more information on how you can cast your votes. Stay tuned for more Nuzlocke content, and until then, remember to always, always, always play around the critical hit.